What's up everyone, my name is Cody Engel and I recently came across a video called Clean Code Horrible Performance and the comments are disabled. So I figured why not watch the video with all of you and I will just respond and give you my thoughts as we're watching it together. So with that out of the way, Let's get into it. Some of the most often repeated programming advice, especially to beginner programmers, is that they should be writing clean code. That name is accompanied by a long list of rules that tell you what you should do in order for your code to be clean. Now, there is no benchmark for this. You cannot actually run something and have it tell you how clean your code is. You can technically just have like a static code analysis tool. It's, I mean, it's not going to tell you this variable should be named properly, but I guess, I mean, chat GPT-4 is out there. So maybe we'll start having some AI generated static analysis tools that can help to apply that. There are several aspects of clean code. In fact, some of the most important ones that are stated are things we could objectively measure because they do affect the runtime of the program that you are writing. There are things like polymorphism is good, ifs and switches are bad. I don't disagree with the advice, although, you know, you need if and switch statements. You can't just write a program that doesn't have them, but it is nicer to just go with object-oriented programming and, and make use of those. Number two, you should never know the internals of something you're working on. It shouldn't know the internals of the thing. One of the reasons why is cognitive overload. If you have to know how everything is working at every point in time, it makes it more difficult to get things done. Whereas you can just trust that the code that you're running will do the thing that you want it to do. You don't need to know exactly how it's working. It also helps if you need to change things up. If you have the internals are just being interrogated all the time by other classes, well, now you can't refactor anything that easily. Number three, functions should be small. Functions should do one thing. Also seem like non-controversial things. Smaller functions are easier to understand. Doing one thing, again, small, easy to understand, <laughs> easier to reuse. If they do a bunch of things, then you can't really reuse them. Finally, number five, don't repeat yourself. That one I would disagree with. DRY, I think, is a pretty terrible acronym. I made a video kind of talking about the different acronyms that we have in programming to try to force you to write better code, but you should repeat yourself. If you there's no clear abstraction, then don't try to force one. And so what I would like to ask is, if we create a piece of code that follows these rules and is clean, how does it perform? In order to construct what I would consider the most favorable case for a clean code implementation of something, I used their own example code. We have a virtual function that does something. And the idea here is we are preferring polymorphism and for functions to just do one thing. A few moments later. Just to make sure that uh, the CPU has enough to look at. Two hours later. And that shows us what happens if you were in a fairly cold cache scenario. So like imagine something was like in the L3. Obviously he's using C++. He's kind of getting into talking about caching and all of that, which are very good things to know about. Although I would say on a day-to-day -day basis, those things aren't as top of mind. They are useful if you do run into performance issues. It's not something that I would be thinking about when I'm actively trying to solve a problem. I would be focusing more so on how do I solve the problem most efficiently where it's not going to be a pain to maintain. <laughs> He's probably approaching software engineering a little bit differently than I would. And we'll, I'm sure we'll probably talk about it some more throughout this video. The clean version of our code took around 35 cycles. What would happen if we violated just the first rule? I'm assuming it will be fewer cycles, <laughs> but we will see shortly, I'm sure. Instead of getting the area from a virtual function, you're gonna get it from a switch statement. Exactly the thing that a clean code lecture would tell you never ever do. So I'm just gonna say, I don't really see any problems with his switch statement. It's been many, many, many years at this point since I've read clean code. I'm probably forgetting about all the nuances in the book, but I work in Kotlin most of the time these days and I use when statements, which are essentially switch functions, but I don't know. I don't see any problem with this. Like to me, yeah, technically it probably is breaking clean code rules, but this is also something that I have no problem with. And I consider myself someone who does write fairly clean code. So with those benefits, what can the compiler do for us? We were able to drop down to 24 cycles per shape. I called it. I knew it. I, I knew it would make it faster. I knew it. I bet you as he violates more of the rules, more of, more of the code's going to run faster. If you were to put that in hardware terms, it would be like taking a iPhone 14 Pro Max 
and reducing it down to an iPhone 11 Pro Max. Eh, I mean, you don't really have to worry about it too much though because Apple hires really smart hardware engineers and they just keep making things faster and faster, which means we can just keep making things more convoluted and slower. What if instead of following these four rules and just breaking this one, we also broke number two? I knew it. I knew the next thing he was gonna do is break rule number two. He's doing it. One of the things that you can see is really these are all computing the exact same function, just with a different coefficient. One of the reasons that I think switch statements are great is because they actually show you this. It's really easy to pull out common patterns when you look at them put together by function rather than by class. And this is actually a reason why I would say DRY, terrible acronym. Repeat yourself until it's pretty obvious what the abstraction should be. And remember, this is not an example that I picked. This is the example that clean code advocates use. So I'm not picking an example where you happen to be able to pull out a pattern. I'm using their example and I can pull out a pattern. I don't know, I, I consider myself a clean code advocate. I don't know that I'd use shapes. I mean, it's a pretty lazy example. It's clear, everyone knows what shapes are, but I mean, to his point, it's also not the most real world example. How often are we creating shapes and how often are companies going bankrupt because they didn't abstract a triangle? Never. We can just introduce a simple table that says what the coefficient is that we actually need to use. So by actually fusing our data model with our actual code, as it usually was supposed to be until clean code happened, we were able to get all the way down to 3.5 five cycles per shape. That's a 10x speed improvement. I would say it is a little bit hard to react to a video and then also code review a video, but at face value, like this, none of this seems crazy to me. The one thing is from the internals, just make sure that you're not reaching in in such a way that is going to make the code harder to update in the future and harder to maintain in the future. This shapes one may not have a very good shining example of when you shouldn't reach into the internal. Just those two ideas are enough to erase 12 years of hardware improvements that hardware manufacturers try desperately to bring you. It's okay for me. I mean, I just write software that reads and writes data for the most part. Still, it is good to know that, I mean, so far, We've agreed on number one, we've agreed on number two. The code I'm writing that I still assume is pretty clean and maintainable also seems to be performant as well. Okay, but here's the thing. We're only doing the simplest possible operation, right? We are doing these two things by default because all we're doing is computing the area. What if we add one more aspect to our problem so that we can follow these two rules of clean code and see how much worse the clean code gets over code that does not try to be clean? In some ways, the video is kind of just showing how shallow clean code might be. I don't really disagree with that. I'm here to spill the tea. So here you can see the exact same hierarchy that we had before, but this time we've added one more virtual function, which gets us a corner count. Here's what it would look like if we use the clean code version. Then we've got the table driven case and the table driven case, as you can see, is awesome. Other than just looking up the one value in the table, which is exactly why table driving things is so good. So I'll be the first to admit, I not a huge math fan, but when I look at the code that he's writing right now, doesn't make a ton of sense. Granted, if I was a programmer that was specializing in shapes and stuff like that, maybe this would just look much more simplistic. I mean, the way he has C table with the shape count, assuming that's total number of shapes, and then it looks like maybe the value, is that just going to be the calculation you're doing? I'm not really sure, but when I see result and it's gonna equal C table with the shape type, and then you're multiplying the shape type by the width and the height, it would be probably helpful just to include some documentation there. I know that's probably beside the point of this video. We've gone from a 10x speed difference to a 15x speed difference. That's like pushing the hardware all the way back to 2008. So instead of erasing 12 years, we're erasing 14 years. You know what else happened in 2008? Financial crisis. You know what that did? wiped out a bunch of money. 
I see some similarities here. But of course, if we wanted to write the optimized version, even just a lightly optimized version, it would be even worse than that. Here's what it looks like if I run all of the routines together, including some actual AVX routines. In the best case scenario, you're looking at a 21x speed difference between an AVX optimized routine. Okay, so for all of you normies that are watching this video, hopefully. AVX is Advanced Vector Extensions. Looks like it's an extension on the x86 uh, instruction set architecture, which makes me just wonder, like if, if that, I mean, assuming that is what it is, what happens if he applied those same things to the clean code? Because in theory, applying that to clean code shouldn't make it filthy. And again, there's no way you're doing any of that using clean code principles. Okay, so I guess I got my answer. If you use AVX at all, you're you're not writing clean code at all. So those the, there's like a Venn diagram of two circles and the circles never intersect. Got it. It's even worse than 15X. 15X is just where you start before you've actually done any optimization or actually trying to target a platform's CPU to the problem at hand all of which always requires breaking these rules. He's not wrong. So like I have AirPods. Those are, are tiny. Like this is like an entire freaking computer in, in this thing that goes in my ear. So I want that to be really optimized. I can imagine that you probably aren't going to write the cleanest looking code for that. Maybe if someone who is working at Apple that worked on these, that is willing to break NDA and, you know, leave a comment down below and let me know if I'm wrong in that thinking, feel free to, uh, but don't say I'm encouraging you because don't get fired from your job. So that leaves us with number five, which is don't repeat yourself. Honestly, don't really have a problem with that rule. The one thing that I had issues with, dry programming. <laughs> is the one thing he doesn't have issues with. In general, it just means don't write the exact same code twice. Prefer to just compose that code with other code as necessary. I agree with that one. I do agree with the statement he just made. I'm not going to say that I disagree with that. Like don't, don't write the exact same thing two times, but feel free to write subtle variations of the same thing twice and don't feel like you need to figure out how to abstract that out. So out of the clean code things you can actually do, I would say you have one you might want to think about and the other four you really definitely shouldn't. Why? Because as you may have noticed, software is extremely slow these days. Software seems fast enough to me, but... The answer of why is software so slow? It's because of quote unquote clean code. These pieces of advice are all absolutely horrible for performance. I would say there's different types of slow. You can have a slow performing application. You can also have a slow to release software team. And I would argue that trying to do what he's doing on a constant basis all the time, you're not going to release software as quickly, which may not be a problem. Like it, it depends on what you're trying to solve. If you are working in high frequency trading, well, maybe, well, actually, no, actually, if you're doing high frequency trading, you probably want to make sure that you can at least trade stuff at a somewhat fast pace, but then you're going to optimize it. So you're going to release it and then you're going to continue to optimize it, optimize it and optimize it. And eventually like it will get further and further away from, from clean code. They were designed because someone thought they would produce more maintainable code bases. But even if it's true that they do produce more maintainable code bases, <laughs> even they do, they, they do produce more maintainable code base. I'm not going to say you need to follow every single point, but if you at least follow bits of the book, like you do get a pretty good code base. That's pretty easy to understand, pretty easy to update, might not run as quickly as possible. Clean code does make your code base more maintainable. It's not a, eh, it might, or it might not. It does. And I think he shows that in this video because his examples are not the easiest to follow the further and further away they get from clean code. It simply can't be the case that we're willing to give up a decade or more of hardware performance just to make programmers' lives a little bit easier. It's not a little bit easier, I would say. I wish I knew what this guy did specifically for a living as a software engineer, because I think he and I are probably in very, very different disciplines, which is fine. But I would say the advice he's giving is for people that are in 
his industry, perhaps working on hardware at a lower level, like assuming like, hey, maybe maybe he's one of the people who worked on these. You did a great job. Thank you. For folks that are working on just a SaaS product. The most important thing is just getting features out to users. Yeah, it shouldn't perform so terrible that it takes them 10 minutes to load data, but if it takes them one second to load the data, they're probably not going to be that upset. If it takes you six months to release a new feature that they've been asking for, they're probably gonna be pretty annoyed. They would probably much rather it performs worse and I'm not gonna say like a little worse, like it could perform much worse. They're probably not going to care as long as they have the feature that does the thing that they want to do. Our job is to write programs that actually run well on the hardware that we're given. Again, it might be his job to do that. <laughs> it's not my job to do that. If I see performance issues, then yes, like let's go ahead and, and figure it out and prioritize it. It's a very, very slippery slope when you start saying, to like an executive leadership team, for example, like it is my job to make sure that this works as efficiently as possible. And I will deliver that thing in one year as opposed to one month, because it's going to be super efficient. Like that's just not going to fly. We can still try to come up with rules of thumb that help you keep your code well organized, easy to maintain and easy to read. Those aren't bad goals but these rules aren't it. And they need to stop being said unless they are accompanied by a big old asterisk that says, and your code will get 15 times slower. I really do appreciate this video. It is very insightful. It is very helpful to understand what will happen. His example is, is in C++. It might vary based on what languages you use and what optimizations are being done. I also think this video is a very good case against cargo culting. Like you should know why you are doing the individual things that you're doing. So if you're saying polymorphism for the sake of clean code, or don't repeat yourself for the sake of clean code, those are not good reasons to do something. You should not do something because you understand what the pros and cons are. I think the most important thing to understand though, is think for yourself understand that clean code, it's a set of ideas. You can either listen to them completely, or you can treat it like the Bible and pick bits and pieces out that you agree with, and then kind of ignore everything else. Similar, the video that he put together, you can listen to it entirely or take bits and pieces. And this video that you're watching right now, you can listen to what I'm saying and take that as gospel and just do all of it. Or what I would recommend, take bits and pieces that make sense because that's what makes life interesting. People disagreeing a little bit, agreeing on other things. And that's it. That's the video. Thank you so much for watching.